Craig Lewis of EX Ministries, and this is an exposition exclusive. I'm here with one of my closest friends, a man who I hold in very high regard, uh, minister, uh, prophet, teacher, preacher, father, husband, all of those things. I just want to welcome uh, Will Ford. Hey, thank you so much, Craig. It's an honor to be with you again, and uh, especially hitting on this topic right here that's so dear to both of us. Yeah, yeah. So what happened was I just, you know, me and Will, we probably say something to each other at least every day, every other day yeah. um, uh, via text or whatever. But this particular thing kind of happened, and I wasn't prepared for... I guess the feedback or the response I would get. Mm. And this is the particular video that I uploaded to Instagram. And I'm gonna I'm show you that video now. I'm killing them. I'm killing them. I'm killing the baby. this video was was actually a ritual yeah. that was done in New York uh, concerning the Roe versus Wade decision that had um, just been handed down, I guess, from the Supreme Court. Yeah, it got leaked, actually. Yeah. It got leaked. I remember when it well, when it first got leaked, you texted it to me yeah. and you said, man, I hope this is real. Yeah. And uh, and then you said, well, yeah, it, it's looking like it is real. Mm -hmm. And so I felt like it was important that um because you know people that follow ex ministries they know our stand on um abortion but i felt like you know it just kind of um i felt like when, once i uploaded it i began to get so much response that it needed a little more light shed on that topic okay. and i felt like i needed an expert uh a person who was really well versed in it to come and uh, we talk about it. Yeah. And of course, to me, this is just an area that you, God has given you expertise and and a gifting. You know, a lot of people have knowledge without gifting. Wow. And this yeah. is an actual yeah. gifting that you have where you can speak into this subject and really help people that have done it or, you know, been a victim of it or, mm -hmm. you know, or even teeter tottering. Uh, with the decision to do it right yeah so i wanted to bring you on and just we just kind of talk chop it up yeah. um and um just kind of get your you know uh, your say on it your take on it yeah my first take is that video you know you you, you text me and you would you, you said man i didn't expect this kind of response from this thing i was like from what you sent me the video and i just saw what you guys saw and i was like like jaw drop yeah one by the uh what the, the intensity of it and then also to the people who actually were doing it in the place where all this is happening in new york city and uh i believe the, it was a church right yeah that's what that's what it looked like it was in front of a church yeah. and so uh but i'm glad actually that it actually got exposed the way it did because this is what is going on when it comes to abortion this is more of a spiritual issue than it is just something that is happening in the natural. Of course, the science, honestly, the science is on the pro-life side. Everybody knows a baby. <laughs> yeah. Right? We got 3D sonograms, right? <laughs> you know, and then ever since the Human Genome Project in the 90s, even the most liberal bioethicists agrees that life begins at conception. Hmm. They all agree with that. So they know that. So if that's the case, why is it after 50 years, and Roe v. Wade actually points out that, you know, once uh, there's this understanding of viability with the, with the child, uh, where the child can feel harm or wh whatever, those kind of, kind of things, if the science proves that, then they put room in it for, for it to be, you know, turned over or, or, or undermined. Mm -hmm. And that hadn't happened all these years because we want to have sex. Yeah. Without consequences. Without consequences. Yep. And the consequence is always a person. It's a child. And that's that's what gets uh, being being left out of the equation. So but beyond that, 
you give a foothold to the devil when you operate in the shedding of innocent blood. Mm -hmm. It opens the door to demonic activity, not just in a family, not just in a home, not just over a person, over a region, over a nation. When there's a shedding of innocent blood, it basically fuels what's happening in the demonic realm. So how is that related? How is abortion? Well, first, let's, let, let, me, let me go back to the Roe versus Wade. So okay. tell me a little bit about what happened in, what was it, 1973? Yeah, 1973. 1973 with Roe versus Wade, and then what just happened with our Supreme Court. Right, so 1973, uh, you look at the, the time frame, what was going on, you know, 1973, but then 1963, you back up, what was happening in the Supreme Court? There was a series of cases that began to shift, not just the influence on the court, but the influence that was being released in the nation. So we had the 1950s, you know, the Ozzie and Harriet days, right? But then when the late 50s, 60s started coming around, things began to shift culturally, especially when it comes to sex, sexuality. You look at the, 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 the Kensington, uh, the Kinsey movement and the, that the whole thing that was happening out of Indiana with that uh, professor and um, Hugh Hefner, who actually used Kinsey's uh, uh, research to basically be the backdrop of Playboy magazine. So they use all these things and all those folks were actually involved in the occult on a level that people didn't realize, especially right. Kenzie himself. So what happens is they begin to open the door to this Pandora's box of, uh, of spirituality. And, and so you have this one group of kids who <clears throat> were seeking um, basically sex without consequence during the uh, free love, free sex movement. Mm -hmm. So the hippie movement turns into the sexual revolution right. as a result of that. And so there are an interesting set of cases that came to the Supreme Court. And within 10 years, it shifted us to a culture of death. Uh, the first one, 1963, there was a case called Engel versus Vital. Engel versus Vital, that was a case that took prayer out of schools. Hmm. So the little prayer spoken by 39 million uh, students, 2 million teachers, 41 million people praying the same little 22 word prayer. God, we ask your protection over our country of our president, that is taken. The pr protective hedge of prayer is taken out of the fabric of our country. Mm. And so um, then the, the next year, um, 1963, uh, there's 1962, Inga versus Vital. 1963, what happens next, Kennedy dies. Kennedy gets killed in Dallas and all of a sudden um, chaos ensues and the whole culture just is it? It's just the, it's the change of the rapid change of everything that's happening, and people begin to use, you know, the medication of self as a way to anesthetize the pain of all the change that was happening in the culture at that time, mm -hmm. right? And you know, music is really key to that, right? <laughs> and so, yet yeah, the the Beatles, the Beatles are singing their song, um, uh, "Lucy in the Sky with Diamonds." Mm -hmm. You know, a lot of people didn't know that they were actually involved in the occult on a very deep mm -hmm. level. I mean, they were worshiping the Maharishi Mahesh Yogi, mm -hmm. but then also, uh, you know, Lennon and a couple others were actually tapping into the occult on a deeper level. But we can't fault them too much because the Beatles also sang another song. They sang, help, I need somebody help. <laughs> but while the world was looking for answers, the church was looking for the rapture. Yeah. And we checked out of society. Yeah. And we started looking for 88 reasons why Jesus was coming back by 1988. Yeah. <laughs> and we stopped releasing any kind of restraint or any kind of godly influence on the culture. So the, you know, we had this powerful revival movement that was happening where people were saving souls, but who was discipling the nation? Right. The devil. The devil starts discipling the nation. Mm -hmm. And so, so before long, policies and laws began to shift. And then the, this Roe v. Wade case comes on the scene. And um, uh, really, I think it was only the Catholics who, who were really like pushing against it at the mm -hmm. time. But the, what happened is it began to open the door to the culture of death where we are in the nation. So from 63 to 73, that case comes on. Norman McCorvey, who didn't have an abortion, by the way, and one of the things they used to fuel the argument was that they said that she was raped by a black man, <laughs> and there was nothing part of it. But that just gave people more fuel, mm -hmm. you know, from the race standpoint to say, okay, we need to do something about this. So, all that to say, we shift in just 10 years to this place where we've been stuck there all this time. And so, uh, but what, is, what has it done? It's opened the door to sexual immorality going to a whole nother level mm -hmm. in, in our nation. A uh, loss for purity, morals uh, has gone to a whole nother level of degradation, and uh, that's that's really what has happened mm -hmm. as a result of it. So now, uh, as, and and 
as far as that, which I appreciate the background information concerning uh, 73. So what happened a couple of weeks ago in the Supreme Court? Uh, so a couple of weeks in the Supreme Court, this is something I've been praying to for a while. Yeah. And uh, honestly, the Lord started showing myself and a few others through, you know, dreams or whatever, different people that he wanted in the Supreme Court. And we've been praying those people in. Mm -hmm. The Lord gave a, a few of them by name and they've been on the, they're on the court now. And so I just kind of saw that there was a case that could come up that could be the one that could turn everything regarding Roe v. Wade. And that's basically what has happened. So there's a case that's come up, um, and I believe it's uh, out, out of Mississippi. And uh, that's the case that is being used to uh, basically challenge Roe v. Wade. And uh, we have at least supposedly six conservative justices, really five. But uh, they, and according to this leaked opinion, which was leaked, to, I believe, to undermine it and to uh, put you know, peer pressure or public pressure on, uh, on the decision that's about to come out, Alito um, is, uh, writes the opinion and four other conservative justices are on it. That was actually done back in February. So the justices, they, they look over these things, they talk about it, and they, there's a lot of discourse that goes back and forth. Uh, for example, in Casey, uh, the Planned Parenthood versus Casey, where they almost overturned Roe v. Wade back in the 90s, like 1992, uh, Justice Kennedy was set to side with the, the conservatives on the court, and they were going to actually overturn Roe v. Wade then. Mm -hmm. But then the night before, he changed his mind. And, and, and went with the, the, the liberal side of the court and you know, it still left us wh where, we are, where we are today. Mm -hmm. So <clears throat> we're praying that doesn't happen now, but uh, I think, honestly, we're at a place where I think this summer we're gonna see Rory Wade overturn. What does that mean though? Because I, I spoke about this before mm -hmm. at, at another place and uh, I, I said, you know, Roe Wade, this summer is gonna be overturned and everybody's like, oh, yeah! And this, now I'm like, yay too, right? Mm -hmm. Yes, yay, but I was actually saying that on my way to the next point. <laughs> Not that that wasn't prophetic, but I right, said right. But on my way to the next point, my next point is this, the church, we gotta step up in terms of adoption. We gotta step up our game in terms of uh, uh, helping those who are in crisis moments when it comes to pregnancy. That's why crisis pregnancy centers are really key, which honestly the church has done a great job in that area, Pastor Craig, because right now we have more crisis pregnancy centers than we do abortion clinics hmm. in our nation. Yeah. And that's been that way since 2007. Yeah. So we've been doing great in that regard, but uh, th what's ha gonna happen now, it's not that abortion is gonna end overnight, what's gonna happen is it's gonna go to the states now. So each state will, will decide mm -hmm. what they're gonna do with, um, with, with, a, with abortion in their state. Thankfully we could live in a good state like Texas, where they value life and they're, they're fighting for it. Um, and a few, a few other states, Oklahoma came out with a pretty intense law as well. And then also there are many states that said that as soon as Roe v. Wade is overturned, abortion will be illegal in our state. So it's something that's already part of their, their state constitution, I believe. So all that to say, it doesn't mean that um, everything is cool and revival is gonna happen <laughs> immediately or whatever, uh, that could happen. What it means is we're going to have to get busy as a church and uh, actually uh, activate more of some of the things we've been putting in place to try to be problem solvers to society mm -hmm. when it comes to taking care of people in crisis moments yeah. for the pregnancy. Well, you said something that was interesting um, um, a little earlier, and you mm -hmm. said that this is a spiritual issue. Yep. And I believe that they leaked, leaked it so that the witches and feminists and different ones could do, actually do this ritual. Yeah, and begin, double, double toil and trouble. Right, right. right. Begin stirring the pot, <laughs> stirring the pot. But I believe that that's what it was. Yeah. That's what that leak was about. Because yeah. I've just kind of, you know, I just did a video on witchcraft and just really kind of dealing with how it works and operates. And a lot of times it has to, you know, they have to bring it to the forefront first. Yeah. And then they get a hold of it and begin to do all of the different rituals and different things. And the church just kind of sits back a lot of times, not yeah. all the times, but a lot of times. And just, you know, we're just going to trust God and believe God for it while mm -hmm. the witches and goblins and whatever are out actually yeah. activating stuff. Yeah. Working their influence. Yeah. yeah and working their around. influence. And mm -hmm. so I want to I want you to talk about that. Like, why is the church? And can I say the African, the predominantly African-American community? Right. 
when did abortion become synonymous with us as the Democrats? You know, we're we're, we're <laughs> I'm trying to say this in the right way, but <laughs> we a lot of times believe that we are Democrats from birth mm -hmm. because we're black. And then right. that particular party usually sides with, you know, abortion or doesn't take a strong stand against it. Right. I don't want to say side with it, mm -hmm. but we don't or we accept abortion in the package as long as they promise the African-American economics. Th there you go. There yeah, you go. So yeah. well, how did that happen? What where did that come from? Because I know, you know, I, I, now, now I, we don't have time for I you know, to go it's, all it's the a, way back. I just got to go just, back to Roosevelt. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, uh, with the New Deal, the few other things, but at the end of the day, here's the thing that's interesting. The, the, there was a case that came out of Louisiana that could overturn Roe v. Wade. Um, and it was put forth by an African-American woman who's a pro-life Democrat. Hmm. Yeah. And so there are a lot of there are a lot more pro-life Democrats out there than people realize. And a lot of my African-American, what the Democratic Party is going to have to deal with is the God gap in their party. Hmm. There's a major God gap. And so, yeah, people like <laughs> um, uh, Gervais and uh, uh, now what's a God gap? Explain a, a God gap. A God gap is OK. Here is. Where, where they are in, in terms of what they want to do with the progressives that are in the Democratic Party. This is how far they want to push it with gender issues, gender fluidity, and all these other things. And there are others who, who are Bible believers who, yeah, well, they, they, they want to be a part of the Democratic Party because some of the history of the civil rights movements and other things, but they ain't willing to go as far. Right, okay. So there's this God gap where you have these people who, 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 who love God, mm -hmm. who are Christians, to a Democrat, mm -hmm. you know, for, for, for all the reasons that they, you know, part of their tradition or whatever, but they're not willing to go to this place mm -hmm. um, with in terms of the far left side of things. Also, too, in the pro-life movement, <clears throat> we got to get over this thing of saying, uh, if you're a Democrat, you ain't Christian. Christianity is not based on the party, it's right. based on the person, That's it. And, and the one who died on the cross. And so it's gonna, we're going to have to work with pro-life Democrats in these states to end abortion, right? Mm -hmm. So you have pro-life Democrats who really are, are strong in, in, in their convictions on this thing. And so uh, those on the other side of the aisle uh, who happen to have an elephant over them, <laughs> they got to focus on the lamb in this hour and mm -hmm. figure out ways to work together to stop abortion in that state. They're, and they're, they're, they're policy ways to do that. And I think that that needs to come forth. Mm -hmm. But when you think about abortion in the African-American community, and then you look at the spiritual side of it, let's talk about the spiritual well, side that, of it. Yeah, yeah, definitely. So, you know, at the end of the day, it's child sacrifice. It's child sacrifice. And uh, in, in Amos, uh, the Lord says, for three transgressions and for four, I have this, this against you that, uh, let me see. Let me, let me read that right quick. Put my cheetahs on. <laughs> cheetahs these days, old, Craig. Right? It's getting old. Like, getting old. It happens. <laughs> it happens. <laughs> <laughs> three transgressions and for four. Look at this. Uh, uh, Amos one thirteen. For three transgressions of the sons of Ammon and for four, I will not re revoke his punishment because it ripped open the pregnant women of the lead in order to enlarge the borders of their territory. So. A lot of people think when they when the Bible talks about child sacrifice, well, abortion is not that because hey, this is this is when they used to take their sons and daughters to Molech and Baal to get them, Molech and Baal to bless their crops, and I mean it was pretty heinous. You yeah, passing them through the yeah, fire, yeah, yeah, passing them through the fire. So the at this big huge thing that had human hands, but the head of a bull, and it was this hot skillet, you know. So you have the furnace that's here, but the furnace they didn't put the baby in the furnace; they put the baby in the skillet which is crazy. And uh, they would beat drums to drown out the screams of the children. Winky Prattney in his book, Devil Take the Youngest, he said that they would actually tickle the children as they were marching them towards Molech and Baal because they felt like if the child was afraid, it would nullify the sacrifice. So they wanted the kid to be joyful. So they would play games. They would tickle the kids, make them laugh all the way up to this thing, beat drums to drown out the screams of the children, and then place them in the hot hands of Molech and Baal, and it would burn them alive. That's how they did it. And so people look at that and they say, well, that's not what abortion is because it's inside the womb. But it's still child sacrifice because even here in Amos 1.13, he says, I have this against you, Ammon, because you ripped 
open the pregnant women of the Galilee in order to extend the, the borders of your territory. So now you have a, a child sacrifice with a child in the womb. So both were happening at yeah. this time period. And also people would actually bury children at the gates of cities because they thought that they warded off uh, it gave him some kind of good luck trauma, whatever, to, to ward off the enemies. That's what they actually did uh, at Jericho, the walls of Jericho. So all that to say, this is a spiritual thing that that is that is taking place. And uh, let me read. This is one of my favorite scriptures to read. Regarding this, is uh, Psalm 106, verse uh, 16 through 17. It says this. Let me start the verse 34. It says. 106, 34, <clears throat> Psalm 106, 34 says, uh, they did not destroy the peoples as the Lord commanded them, but they mingled with the nations and learned their practices and served their idols, which became a snare to them. Verse 37, they even sacrificed their sons and daughters to demons and shed innocent blood, the blood of their sons and daughters, whom they sacrificed to the idols of Canaan. And the land was polluted with Blood. Thus they become unclean in their practices and play at the harlot in their deeds. Why? Because they were sacrificing their, their sons and daughters to Molech and Baal to bless their craft. Now, today, it's basically the same demons different day, but ours is called the God of convenience. Mm. It's not convenient to have a child right now, mm. so let's just get rid of them. Yeah. And so we do that, and so <clears throat> um, what's hap what happens with that, when the I'll just put it like this. When the people that you cannot see can become optional, talking about the child in the womb, when the people that you cannot see can become optional, it's inevitable that other people that you can see can also be dehumanized mm -hmm. and marginalized even to the place of elimination. Mm -hmm. Like we saw with George Floyd. Well, but God weeps over all the shedding of innocent blood. The whole thing, a Philando Castile one, that one actually got me more than any of them. But the thing is this, he weeps over all the shedding of innocent blood and, uh, and so when we look at the race issue, we look at these things, uh, if you don't start valuing life in the womb, we'll dehumanize other people yeah. eventually later on. So yeah. he weeps over all the shedding and said, blood. like some people say black lives matter. I, I get what they're trying to, trying to talk about. I'm, I can get with the emphasis more than I can with the entity. <laughs> uh, people say all lives matter. I know what they're trying to convey, but God is saying drill down deeper, life matters. Yeah. Period. Because when the people that you cannot see become optional, it's inevitable other people that you can see can be dehumanized and marginalized even to the place of elimination. So that brings in the whole thing of eugenics with abortion, mm -hmm. which is the pink elephant in the room with the race issue. Because nobody wants to talk about that because eugenics hits on the whole thing of immigration. It hits on mass incarceration and it hits on abortion as well. And so uh, what is eugenics? It's just a sophisticated name for races. Yeah. And there was a class thing. Uh, the eugenists believe that populations grow geometrically and food supplies grow arithmetically. In other words, there's not going to be enough food left for the people who really deserve to be here. Right. Which at that time was white people in power. And uh, that's how they saw it. But then there's more of a class thing, too, because you actually had some of the elite African-Americans who were part right. of the eugenics movement as well, mm -hmm. like the Bose and a few others. So but the thing is, um, the eugenists thought, you know, so the thing we need to do is uh, we need to weed out the people that we want to have less of. And if we can prevent them from being born, that's one thing. But then if they're born, let's just sequester them away from the rest of society so that they don't deplete resources. And so they actually felt like things like poverty and crime were inherent in somebody's gene pool. Mm -hmm. Like, in other words, uh, uh, they felt like poverty and crime were just as much of an inherited trait as the color of somebody's eyes. Right. So the all black people were like that. And uh, uh, any poor people, poor white person, they all put them into this category. And so what happens is you wind up having over 33 states in our nation that had eugenic sterilization laws mm -hmm. where they could come along and sterilize somebody if they saw fit. Uh, I had a good friend, uh, Elaine Reddick in um, North Carolina, that a eugenic sterilization board put in place. He was raped at 13, unfortunately and um, had a child after that. So she gets married later on and she, she wants to have children. She finds out, she, you know, why can't I have children? She went on to college, became a nurse, she's married, and she found out that the North Carolina Eugenic Sterilization Board determined, because she was African-American young girl, that she was an imbecile, a moron, and unfit 
to have any more children. So they sterilized her at 13 years old. Come to find out they didn't just do it to her, they did it to over 7,600 people mm. in the state of North Carolina. 1,500 of them were still alive. And so the last eugenic sterilization, you know, the last eugenic sterilization kind of law came off the books 2006. Yes. So from the 20s all the way to then, we had these kind of laws on the books. So no wonder Hitler, Hitler hung out with folks in California who, who were doing this kind of thing because they, they had uh, eugenics camps set up with people there. So he just kind of modeled that to put together the internment camps that he had in, in, uh, back in, um, in Germany. And so he studied the writings of you know, Lanthrop Stoddard and a few others, but also, and, and, and also uh, Madison Grant, who wrote the book, uh, The Passing of the Great Race, and he uh, actually was the, uh, the founder of the Bronx Zoo. So <clears throat> he loved him, and he also loved this lady named Margaret Sanger. Margaret Sanger mm -hmm. also was one of these folks, and Margaret Sanger, she said that black people like weeds and need to be exterminated, and uh, she uh, basically kept her, kept her agenda hidden for a while. Uh, she was working with uh, one of the heirs to Procter & Gamble, C.J. Gamble, who was a major heir, who was on the North Carolina Eugenics Board. Uh, and he said, you know, to do this project and, and get it to, you know, proliferate, I know you want to use black people to be in, the, <laughs> in your clinics to lure, lure them in, but I don't know if we can tr trust, he said, a darkie. I don't know if we can trust darkies <laughs> with running the clinic. And then Margaret Sanger said back to him in her letter, December 10th, 1939, here's what she said. We don't, word, we don't want word to get, get out that we want to exterminate the Negro race. Therefore, the Negro minister is the one who can disquiet the more rebellious members should they find this thing out, end of quote. So too late, I found out, you find out where some of those rebellious members, but mm. the deal is that's what they were pushing forth at that time period. So they started this thing called the Negro Project. And with the Negro Project, they would go and put together these tent revivals and have white pastors invite black churches to the tent revivals. And the white pastors were actually in on the, on the thing with Planned Parenthood, was Margaret Sanger at the time. But before black people go, could go into the revival tent, they had to go into Margaret Sanger's tent first where they talk to black folks about sterilization and why they need to get rid of their children, not, rid of, not have so many children. And it's, it's fascinating. Even during that time period, Craig, they had, a, they, had a, they had a preaching contest for preachers who could preach the best eugenic sermon. Yes, they would pay them $500 if you could come up with the best eugenic sermon. And back then, that, yes. was, that was a grip. That was a lot of money, right, in, 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 in the 20s or whatever. So think about it. And you had these white pastors and black pastors and taking this money, and they were using ser you know, the, the, the sermon illustrations like uh, 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 purity and, and uh, purifying uh, the silver with the dross. And that's what they would say, yeah, the, the people who need to be weeded out of society are the dross of society need to be cleaned away mm -hmm. so that the pure could come forth that are the eugenic. And that was literally a part of the sermon series that these people were preaching that time period. So you had people in the church complicit with at that time period. And so Margaret Sanger, she had a friend named Havelock Ellis who told her, she said, you know, you need to change the name of your organization from Birth Control Review to something else that is more, a little bit more palatable, palatable. Why don't you change it to Planned Parenthood? She said, you know what, you're right. So that's why she changed the name to Planned Parenthood. And she opens up her clinic in Harlem. And it isn't any wonder in 2014 in New York, New for African Americans, the abortion rate is higher than the birth rate mm. because of that agenda. Yeah. And so, um, so anyway, that's, that's, that's the other part of it that's really, really key is the, the race element yeah. that comes in it. Now, Planned Parenthood actually finally acknowledged that Margaret Sanger was a racist after all these years. And they, uh, like a year and a half ago, because of everything that was going on with George Floyd, they disavowed her hmm. for the first time ever. But if you really want to disavow her. In Planned Parenthood. Yeah, it stopped killing people. <laughs> that's abortion, what I'm saying, right? yeah. 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 So that's, that's what I'm saying. And then even uh, the Bronx Zoo, they, they came out and they said, you know what, uh, Madison Green, our founder, we disavowed, and they disavowed her. So there is a day of reckoning on this thing. And the ultimate linchpin of that reckoning is Roe v. Wade coming to an end. Because this is about, at the end of the day, human dignity, and it's also about cleansing the spiritual atmosphere of our nations and other nations yeah. of the earth. Yeah, yeah, and I, you know, you can see the race thing really being pushed, and 
you know, I kind of want you to speak to this. I'm going to read this tweet that I did the okay. other day, mm -hmm. and it, it was, the devil wants a race war. Oh, if yeah. he can make us focus on the outside, which man judges, mm -hmm. we will disregard the inside, which God judges. Mm. When we do this, we will begin to see people the way elitists see them as expendable. <sighs> And, uh, wow. that's, and, and so that's what powerful. that does is that it's just, true. like you said, it just desensitizes us to where, you know, when we judge the outside of people, mm -hmm. we leave their heart out. Yes. Then they become less than human to us. Mm. And then we'll eventually, you know, and it's all going to the metaverse. It's all going to, yep. you know, the the one person, I'm a God, I'm in the corner, I'm wearing the <laughs> Oculus glasses and I can be whoever I want to be eating Fritos and, you know, <laughs> the, 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 yeah. that's the life, you know, yeah. but it's going to that because there'll be no value on real people. Wow. And that's what it's to me. That's what it seems like uh, they're taking away just the value of human life altogether by showing pornography, women, you know, uh, exposing themselves on the Internet, showing their bodies, all these different things. You know, the more you look at that, the less human that person appears to you. They become you begin to objectify them. Yeah. And so all of this objectification, all of these different things. And then they have things like the Met Gallery and different things where folks come out looking like straight freaks. <laughs> yeah. So they, that ain't human. So, ain't human. you, you, you yeah. know, and you begin to just lose sensitivity for human life and people become expendable become expendable and you know that's that's the other demonic piece of this is what actually goes to that ritual that you showed earlier this whole understanding of uh the spirit that's over the makes like the called the zeitgeist the spirit of the age over abortion right now is this demon called lilith so um back during the days of uh was Let's say Isaiah 34, 14. Isaiah, Isaiah 34 and 14, God is judging. He's judging Edom at the time period. And he says that the, the let me read, let me read the scripture real quick. Isaiah 34, verse 14 says, uh, and the desert creatures shall meet with the wolves. The hairy goat also shall cry to his kind. Yes, the night monster shall, shall set her there and shall find herself a resting place. So God is judging this particular uh, uh, country or whatever at the time period. And he's talking about uh, what he's gonna do. So he's driving this thing out into this waterless place. And he says that the hairy goat, the word the hairy goat there, he could have used any other word for goat, but that word for hairy goat there is the word satir. That's the Hebrew word for demon. Mm -hmm. So he's talking about a demon. Also shall cry to his kind, yes, the night monster shall settle there and find herself a resting place. The word night monster, it's also translated in the, in the King James as screech owl. He could have used any other word for screech owl, but he chose to use the word Lilith. It's the first and only time it's used in scripture. And according to Browns and uh, Browns, Drivers and Briggs, their lexicon, it says that Lilith was believed to be the female demon goddess of the Edomites that haunted the desolate places. So, you know, demons, they always show up in different times in different cultures and mm -hmm. To, to ascribe parallels and, yeah, and different things. Yeah, yeah, parallels, different things. You know, you got Minerva over here, but then she's uh, Diana over there, whatever mm -hmm. region. It's the same demon, different culture. Mm -hmm. uh, but they take on these legends and myths, and if you understand the legend and the myth, you understand what is uh, what is operating, right. what it's doing. Exactly. So the legend is fake, but the spirit is real. Right. So it turns out that in the the folks in the follow the the, the Kabbalah, like the the uh, this mystical Jewish side of that's of, a long uh, story, yeah, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, uh, Judaism. Uh, they had this witchcraft side of Judaism called the Kabbalah, and they believed this legend about a woman named Lilith. Lilith was believed to be the first wife of Adam mm -hmm. who refused to submit to Adam in, 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 in every way, including sexually. And so according to this legend and myth, um, one day God judged Lilith and turned her from a hybrid human being with wings into a full-fledged demon and killed a hundred of her demon children every day. So according to the legend and myth, Lilith vowed that she would visit Adam at night with sexual dreams so she, so she could take his seed from the, from the wet dreams and procreate more demon children. Mm -hmm. But then Lilith also said that she vowed that none of Eve's children would live, to, live beyond their first birthday. So that's the legend of Lilith. 
So why is that important? Well, with Gloria Steinem and Betty Friedan, mm -hmm. they start the Jewish women's feminist movement. There's three waves of feminism. And the first one was Susan B. Anthony, who was a godly woman, who was pro-life, actually. But then you also had the next one with Margaret Sanger, that group. But then the third wave of feminism was a neo-pagan feminist movement. And they believed that, they, they, well, here's what they said. Gloria Steinem, Betty Friedan, especially Betty Friedan, she said, we're not like Eve from my other Hebrew legend. We're like Lilith. And they chose Lilith to be the icon for their movement. They chose this weed woman to be the icon for their movement. They actually came out with a magazine called Lilith, Lilith Magazine. Fair. Lilith Fair. Around. Was it Lilith Fair? Yeah. Lilith Fair were actually kind of born out of that too. Mm -hmm. Sarah McLaughlin uh, connected to that whole theme as well. Um, all those things. And they actually came out with a, <laughs> a, a, an organization called the Lilith Fund. The Lilith Fund will help any woman who can't afford an abortion pay for abortion. That's Lilith attacking babies right out of the womb. And so, uh, but that, that, that same spirit was over them. Now, uh, Gloria Stein and Betty Friedman, especially Betty Friedman, Betty Friedman starts the National Organization for Women, which is the biggest abortion lobby. And she also stars NARAL, National Alliance for Repeal of Abortion Laws. She starts with both of those, but the spirit that was over that whole thing was this, uh, this Lilith entity. Now, in witchcraft, and you know this from your study and other people you're running with, Lilith was, is, is a major high-ranking uh, mm -hmm. uh, demonic uh, principality that they actually pray to. Mm -hmm. and, the, and they pray to her in the different forms that she appears in, even in culture. So when these young ladies are there in front of this church doing this ritual, I mean, I'm looking at Lilith personified mm -hmm. through these young people, and it's, it's heartbreaking to yeah. watch it, to see them under the influence of this thing. Also, too, at the Texas Capitol, where uh, a few years ago, where they were, there was abortion law coming, coming down the pike, they actually had witches come, and they began to pray to the goddess of liberty that's on top of the, statu the top statue on the, on, the, on the state legislature. They start praying to it to draw down power to block legislation to try to stop what was happening with the ending of abortion hmm. uh, in, in the state of Texas. It didn't work, but that's what I'm saying. And if you heard the clips of what they were praying and saying during that time period, it's creepy. It makes the hair stand up on the back of your neck and nape of your neck. All that to say, this is way more of a spiritual issue than we realize. Yeah. And uh, these people who are, who, are, who are manifesting this stuff, we're just getting, getting a chance to see uh, the enemy basically overplaying his hand, letting people see what's actually taking place in the spirit realm mm -hmm. with those who are really drawing allegiance to him. Yeah. And that's what, you know, that's what the ritual was. The lady was, you know, she had rags tied around the baby, but she made sure as she was pulling it to let you know, I'm, I'm, I'm ripping the baby apart. Yeah. And, you know, that particular people don't realize when you see a ritual like that in the natural, something is going on in, in the, the spirit, spirit realm. realm. And, yeah. you know, that's why we as believers have to make sure that we, you know, we're praying and we're believing and we're doing what we need to do yes. in the spirit realm because, you know, it's not a flesh and blood. It's not a all. flesh and blood thing. Yeah. You know, I mean, yeah, I, I, there are people I know who have worked for Planned Parenthood, who got saved and don't work for them no more, and doing amazing things for the kingdom of God. Mm -hmm. You know, Abby Johnson is one of them. She's a friend of mine. Another one, Carol Everett. She's a friend of mine. Carol Everett uh, used to own several abortion clinics in there. She wanted to become a millionaire, multimillionaire, by on as many abortion clinics as she, she could get. Wow. And uh, she got saved, <laughs> got turned her life around, and now she has like several crisis pregnancy centers, and she's a major voice for mm -hmm. life now. But here's what she said that was so key, Craig. She said back then she would go into high schools and, and middle schools and talk with kids. This is, this is in like the 80s, Craig. This is in the 80s. She would go into high schools, middle schools, and would talk to uh, get, get, get the opportunity to talk to kids about sex, making fun about sex, right? Why? Why to make fun about it? Break down their defenses, mm -hmm. right? And then she bakes a bond with them, right? And then she says, you know, if y'all you, get in trouble, you need help, you come find me, my clinic's right down the street, you need condoms, you need birth control pills, whatever. She says she loved to do that, especially get the young girls in by 13, because she knew that if she got them in by 13, taking birth control pills, by 18, in those five years, she would get at least three to five abortions out of them by that time period. Because she said they would give them a low doses birth control pill, knowing that if they took birth control, they would have more sex. But they had low doses birth control pill, they have more opportunity yeah. to get pregnant and then come in for the big, you know, big money check that they were looking for 
which is basically what, $600, $300 at that time to, to have an abortion. Yeah. So hmm. this thing is way more of a, yeah, it's a money thing, but it's a witchcraft thing all oh, yeah. at the same time. Yeah, yeah. definitely. Mm -hmm. Spiritual. So people are getting saved and coming out of it. So yeah, we can change laws, we can change legislation. And uh, we just depend on five people sitting on the Supreme Court to, to turn, turn our nation around. Good luck. Man, this is going to say <laughs> prayer. Yeah. We're going to say fasting. We're going to have to kick in mm -hmm. uh, to a whole nother level of, of prayer and spiritual warfare. And part of that warfare is not just praying, but how we love people. Man. Love is a powerful weapon. Man. You know what I'm saying? Man. So yeah. I, I, I think the last demon I had to deal with in a person, mm -hmm. I was able that the, the demon came out of the person because of love. I kept speaking love wow. and I kept saying, no, I love this guy. I love him. I love him. And the demon actually dislodged from it <laughs> without any yelling. And, yeah. you know, I didn't have to hit him yeah. with the Bible and throw something out of nothing. <laughs> it was just love. And I yeah. saw that because I felt led by God to do it that way because yeah. God wanted to show me how powerful love really is. Yeah. Love and reconciliation mm -hmm. will heal the nation. It will heal the nation. And that's, you know, that's, that's where people need to be. Let me, let me touch on this last sure. thing. Um, I want you to clearly speak this. Mm -hmm. And so, so we'll know, so people will know why is abortion not an option for a believer? Oh, uh, well, for, well, for anybody, but yeah, for, we're speaking to believers. Yeah, so. for, for it's, it's not an it's not an option, uh, especially for the believer. The reason why is because think about it. God has a dream. You know, we have dreams. You know, dreams in the night. But then we have dreams that like aspirations, right? Think about it. God had a dream one day, and then He wrapped flesh and bone around that dream, and you became the dream of God. Hmm. I became the dream of God. Every time a person is born in the earth. It's an opportunity to release the hope and the love of God into a generation. You know, how does he turn a generation around? Unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. Mm. So every time a person is born, <laughs> it's, it's, that, it's, it's that, that potential of life that's coming from God into the, in, in, into the earth. And so regardless of the situation, when people look at what's happening with, you know, the backseat lover thing or the, the athlete who got the girl pregnant is like, oh, it's going to mess up my dreams. I'm going to go play basketball. I was going to play football, whatever. Uh, I, I can't do this now. I want to go to college. Listen, that baby is the very blessing that's going to redeem the situation. Children are a blessing from the Lord. Yeah. And so, uh, and it's interesting with Molech and Baal. Molech and Baal always wanted the first child, the firstborn. Who's the child that always gets killed in an abortion? Most of the time, it's the firstborn. Mm -hmm. It's the firstborn. And so it's not an option for the believer because, one, God is releasing a blessing in your life through the situation. I don't care how yeah. you know, bad you think the situation is between you and the other person, but that baby is going to be the very one that redeems the situation. And also, the Lord's not just concerned about that child. He's concerned about you, too. Mm -hmm. And so he wants to bring healing to your heart, even that man's heart. And he, he's going to use that to bring healing. Hmm. Yep. Well, good answer. Yep. Um, finally, let me ask you, ask you this. A person that is uh, maybe was sexually assaulted and got pregnant, which yep. we know the, you know, the um, chances of that happening are very, very slim, but it yeah, does it, happen. It happens, yeah. So how does a person... Yeah, and that's 1% of the time. 1%. Of yeah. all the time. But of that 1%, half, 50% of those women decide to keep the child. Mm. Why? Because they know that that child is a very blessing that can redeem the situation. Wow. And so many people say that this is a hard case, but you know, you shouldn't have, you shouldn't punish the child for, right. for, for what happened in the situation. You can get the baby off for the adoption, for adoption if you want, but keeping it, I think it'd be a powerful, powerful blessing too, to bring a turnaround and also to break a generational curse mm -hmm. that's happening through this other situation. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. And, and finally, this is the last thing I, I really wanted to do. Um, people that have had, oh yeah, have had. Now, that's probably the biggest response. Mm -hmm. People, you know, contacted me. Hey, you know, I, I did it. I did it for this reason. I did it for this reason. But I mean, I've, I, people tell me that they hear babies crying. Yes. They, they, you know, some of them keep producing milk, can't stop producing milk. Ugh. 
Uh, yeah. Just I've heard all kinds of things. Yeah. And my heart goes out to them. Mm -hmm. um, but I hadn't, you know, had that experience in my life. So mm -hmm. I feel like a person, sometimes God takes people through certain things yeah. to give them wisdom and understanding on certain things. Yeah. And I believe that's what happened with you. All of this came to be because, you know, of, of, of your past. And yeah, my past kind of with this that. whole thing, that's the, the painful thing about it. Yeah, I, I paid for an abortion. Mm -hmm. You know, 30 some odd years ago, uh, maybe longer than that now, I'm so old. <laughs> you are old. <laughs> we, we do know that. that we do Man, know. Yeah, yes. I, I paid for an abortion and it was abortion of my first. I wish I could say that at the time, Craig, that I was not a Christian, but I was. Mm -hmm. See, abortion is the fig leaf in the church that we use to cover up our sexual immorality. Mm -hmm. And so uh, I remember being in that clinic and I remember um, my girlfriend was there. And it's probably the first time I heard the voice of the Lord, like where I recognized God talking to me. And he, he said to me, this is not a choice. This is a child. Mm. This is not a process. This is a person. Mm. So my girlfriend came out and I thought she had changed her mind because she came out so fast, but she went through it. it. It happened that fast. And she said the guy just methodically went around the room to room. Girls were just in stirrups and he just methodically went from room to room and performed the procedures. Some girls were in the back just hysterical crying, but they wouldn't let them leave until they composed themselves or they just rushed them out the back door because they didn't want them to influence the girls in the waiting room. Yeah. Mm. So, so we just, I just, we just sat in that car and just, we didn't cry, we just silent for like five hours. Years later, I mean, I went through a lot of healing, a lot of deliverance, but I remember in being in Washington, D.C., and I was praying. We actually were praying for over the life issue. And I began to have this excruciating pain, like people were talking about, you know, this guy, guy would have let me hear screams or different things. I had this excruciating pain come up out of the pit of my gut. I'm like, God, what is this? I thought I was having a nervous breakdown or something. And the Lord said to me, I'm allowing you to mourn the loss of not holding that child in your arms for the first time from your abortion. And I just like, I was like, oh my God, God, I miss, I miss that baby, I miss that child. And so I uh, went through a time of prayer and uh, actually gave the child a name, named him William Lawrence Ford IV. <laughs> and uh, and uh, I believe his, his inheritance is to see abortion in this nation. But uh, beyond that, I went actually uh, shared my testimony. First time, it was the first time I shared my testimony about uh, that experience. And I called forth guys who uh, had paid for an abortion, whether it was an abortion of their own child or they gave money to a friend. Like movie, the five heartbeats, mm -hmm. you know, where they, they would give money to him so he could pay. <laughs> Man, that's blood money, bro. We, yeah. I mean, it looked cool in the movies. And yeah. I like Robert Townsend, but at the same time, it opened the door to something spiritually mm -hmm. uh, in people's lives that, that was really uh, horrific. You know, not just women, but men get robbed of something in, in abortion. They get robbed as a man. You get robbed of the provide, being the provider, is something that means something to a man, a protector, mm. it means something. I've had to talk guys out of suicide because their girlfriend decided to have an abortion. That one guy I know, had, he committed suicide because his girlfriend decided to have an abortion. This affects both men and women in profound ways. Mm. And, and you know, you have people on TikTok now talking about shout your abortion and they, yeah. hey, I'm in the clinic right now. And yeah. I'm, you know, they, they're throwing this party. They don't realize maybe five weeks later, maybe five years later, they're gonna be, they're gonna hear a vacuum cleaner go off and it's gonna remind them of the vacuum cleaner that was used. It's 20 times, 29 times more powerful than the vacuum cleaner at home. They suck that child out of them. They're going to hear that thing go off and something's going to click and they're going to get triggered, which is everybody's favorite word right now. So this is an emotional thing. This is a spiritual thing, but it can bring healing too. Why do I say that? Shared that testimony that night. There was men that came forward. Demons were being cast out. Young ladies came forward and we knelt before them and apologized on behalf of the men because we were intercessors. You know, we stood in the gap Mm -hmm. to, on behalf of the man that was a part of your abortion, mm -hmm. I want to apologize to you for treating you like a piece of meat. I want to apologize to you for not wanting to be the father of your child. I want mm -hmm. to apologize to you for manipulating you into the, you doing something that you regret for the rest of your life. Yeah. So sorry. We did that and we broke the power of, you know, Molech, Bell, little off people, and we saw powerful deliverances happen. But one of those girls went back to this particular city and out of 12 abortion clinics there, she starts a prayer meeting, one of them. 
And I found out about it. It just happened to be the same abortion clinic that I walked into hmm. 30 years earlier hmm. with that girlfriend of mine. She went to the same abortion clinic where I went to, to pray. So I found out about it. And, and uh, one of the girls who was praying in front of that clinic had a dream. And in the dream, the Lord said, if you'll do this prayer meeting for 40 days straight, this clinic will shut down. So they did it 40 days straight. They prayed. By that time, uh, the, the security guard who was in front of the clinic who befriended them came out to him and said, hey, y'all, what y'all doing must be paying off. This clinic is going to shut down at the end of November. Mm. So. What happened is that abortionist got exposed for Medicaid fraud. He had done another botched abortion. Somebody died. Nobody, he never went to jail for any of the wrong things. Because this is a spiritual issue, right? Exactly. He had a, he had a demonic covering over him. But prayer broke through that. He gets exposed for Medicaid fraud. He goes to prison for several years, I think like seven years. During that time, all five of his clinics get shut down. Mm. Right. And that happened on November 30th, 2007. November 30th is my birthday. Mm. Why would this happen on my birthday? Because every person who's conceived deserves to have a birthday. Yeah. So the Lord is serious about this thing. And, you know, and, uh, and for the believer, you don't want to do this because it opens the door to lack. That's what abortion does. It aborts things, aborts dreams, aborts purposes. You know, your, your, your money gets cursed. It opens the door to, to different things, too, mm -hmm. uh, sp spiritually, physically. And so, you know, if you, you want that bondage broken out of your life, this, who, yeah. who am I talking to? Yes, you right here. Look, I'm, I'm talking to you right now, young lady. There is a better way. God loves you, and he has a plan not just for your baby, but also for your life. And your child is the very blessing that God's going to use to heal this situation. Young man, I know you had that dream, being an athlete or, or whatever, going on your your career, or whatever, you think that abortion is a quick fix to, 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 to remedy a situation so you can go on? Listen, don't sacrifice your son or daughter to the God of convenience. God has a plan for that child. He has a plan for you. And guess what? His plan, his purpose for you is way bigger, way more powerful than you can even realize. God has a plan for you and that child. Don't forfeit your destiny as a father, as a protector, and as a provider. I want to pray for you right now. Wherever you are in this whole situation, those are just two things that come to my mind. But right now, can I pray for you? Because God loves you. I want to pray for you right now. Father, right now, I just pray for this young lady. I pray for this young man. Wherever they are right now, I pray for that young couple who think That's they don't right. have enough money for this first child. God, I thank you. Lord, that this child is the very blessing that you're going to use to redeem the situation in Jesus' name. And Lord, I ask you for a turnaround of their hearts. I ask that you use this to turn around their minds to understand the spiritual consequences of what could be released and unleashed in their lives. But Lord, for those who have done this already, Lord, I thank you for forgiveness. Yes, Lord. Lord, you said if we confess our sins, you're faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us of all unrighteousness. So right now, right now, wherever you are, just confess this thing right now before the Lord, before you, between you and the Lord right now. Confess what you did and watch what God does to bring healing to your heart. Lord, I thank you for the healing of even the memories of that moment, Lord, that it won't have any sting any longer. Yes, Lord. And I break the power of even the word curses spoken over by other family members and other things. And I break the power of soul ties between men and women who, who were part of these uh, uh, abortions, the shedding in of blood. God, I break the power of their name off their life. I thank you that their, their, the name of their memory, the memory of their name no longer has any influence over their destiny any longer because they forgave the night. I thank you that the hook is gone and the spiritual tie is broken yes, Lord. in the name of Jesus. And I speak freedom over you in Jesus' name. I break the power of Molech, Baal, Lilith, abortion and death off your life today. And I speak life over you. I prophesy hope over you. I prophesy God's purpose and plan over your life in Jesus' name. Yes. Amen and amen. 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 Yeah. Well, I'm so glad you, you, you came and did this. I just feel <laughs> like on. it's going to help a lot of people. Man, it helps me. You know, it's the, the power of the testimony. You know, yeah. I don't get a chance to talk about this enough, you yeah. know. Uh, I speak at you know banquets and events, but to sit down and do this, yeah, especially with you, you have no idea how much this means to me. Yeah. 
Yeah, man. 15 years ago, we put that DVD out. Yeah. And now look what God is doing in the nation. Look what he's doing mm-hmm. in the nation. So man. I can't thank God enough for you enough yeah. and just the whole ES Ministries platform and what you've done with this and just, you know, champion for truth, champion for Christ. I love you. I love your family. I love your, our relationship. And that's just thank God for you. Yeah, thank God for you too, man. Yeah. And, uh, thank God for all that came today. And yes. uh, we'll be back uh, with another Installment. Exposition <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> exclusive mm-hmm. real soon. God bless you.